because Sean is uh, going to start um, being a regular on the Ask the Biologist. He called it Ask a Biologist on our show. I'm calling it Ask the Biologist. I have so much respect for him. Project Noble Beast. Go and look that up if you want to do some um, grassroots learning. Uh, the most advanced study ever done on creating stress in muskies through angling, what we do to them, and what you need to know to help them survive. Lisa, do you have Sean there? I hope you do. Hey, everybody. Hey, John. Wow. Good timing, Sean. Nice to see you again, sir. Wow. Yeah, what's happening? Oh, so happy you are here. We're going to talk some muskies in, uh, in our new Ask a Biologist segment. I have you heard how excited I am. The reaction from everybody in the Ottawa chapter this week, I got emails. We were phoning back and forth after. Just wow, exciting times. So happy awesome. to have you. And uh, why don't you tell everybody who you are first in, in, in case some of them don't know and uh, yeah. what you're going to do here. Sure thing. Yeah. So for those of you that don't uh, that don't know me, I'm an instructor at Carleton University. I'm a trained fisheries ecologist. Uh, some of you, especially if you're in the in the area or been musky fishing for a while, may be familiar with Project Noble Beast. I know John talks about it as well. And Project Noble Beast we did about ten years ago. Uh, it was really the first uh, concerted study uh, to validate current handling procedures for muskies. So how we handle muskies when we catch them and then release them. Uh, it was the first real study to look at whether that was the best approach to handling and releasing muskies. Uh, of course, it you know you, you guys don't need me to tell you necessarily that it works. There's been lots of anecdotal evidence for a long time, but there were management agencies that said, well, it's not we, we don't see it in the literature. We don't see it in the academic literature. And so, you know, anecdotal observations don't work. So we uh, we set out to actually, you know, apply some very robust science to it. And it was a great study. I had a blast for two years, learned a lot about the area, learned a lot about muskies. Uh, and I'd been a muskie fisherman for a while before that. And uh, it was just like a marrying, you know, two of my passions, it was wonderful, so. Um, and then I, I went and moved to Prince Edward Island for about six years, but uh, six or seven years. But now I'm back uh, and very happy to be back in Ottawa where I can pursue muskies and study them. And yeah, the, the collaborations that I know are gonna, we're going to form over the next however long uh, will, be, will be awesome. So happy to be here. Oh, happy to have you. And you learned to muskie fish in, in Illinois and Wisconsin, too. Is that right? Yeah, actually, mostly Illinois. Yeah, I, can, I think I may have only fished in Wisconsin for muskies once, but I grew up, I was born in Chicago and then grew up about two and a half hours south of Chicago where the University of Illinois is. And, you know, Illinois doesn't have very many water bodies with muskies in it. So, but I was, I was putting a lot of miles on my truck, uh, hauling, the, hauling the boat around to try and chase those things in Illinois. So, uh, yeah, I cut my teeth on on those weird impoundments down there. Very different from the natural systems we have here in Canada. What a great perspective you bring to to research, and we're so happy to have you um, here at Carleton University tonight for Ask the Biologist. Um, you uh, you dealt with this question last week, and so uh, what are you going to tell us? Uh, I'm going to start off this series by talking about color patterns in, in muskies and how they establish themselves within, within fish. Uh, and then there's kind of like some offshoot questions about, well, can we actually end up creating families of muskies that create this, that, that all look the same, that all have similar color patterns? And then is it possible that, that some of these fish that have different color patterns actually behave differently than other individuals with different color patterns. So we're going to kind of break that down over about five to 10 minutes. So I can, uh, my screens, uh, I, I got it up here. So whenever Lisa wants, wants me to, uh, to talk on the, yeah, there we go. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Yeah. I had to throw that up there. You, uh, John, that you, uh, you told me to get rid of the A biologist. So I put the ask the biologist. Um, but yeah, so let's uh, let's let's kick this off here. Um, let me get my screen going. All right, 
So just some real basics about what we know relative to color patterns in, in muskies and the types of color patterns we see. So in true string muskies, I'm not talking about hybrids because they're kind of a beast unto themselves, beautiful animals, but they're like a whole other topic. Um, in true strain muskies, we primarily have clear color patterns. We have three color patterns, but one of them is clear. So this is like a Rito River fish here from Mike that Mike caught this year. Uh, it's a very classic looking uh, clear patterned muskie for the Rito system. Then we've got barred fish. So this, this beast of an auto river fish, that's a pretty classic barring pattern. Uh, that we tend to see in muskies. Uh, another place you might see is strong barring would be Lake of the Woods. Those fish tend to have quite a bit of barring as well. Um, and then of course, the really, really spectacular spotted muskies, uh, like this one that Lisa caught here uh, when she was fishing with Lawrence. Um, so the, the fish that have that spotted pattern you tend to see in places like the St. Lawrence, the Great Lakes, Lake St. Clair, uh, places in Minnesota like Leech Lake, uh, bit of vermilion as well. Um, but primarily we have we have those three color patterns. Now the question becomes, well, for any of you, let me back up for a second. For any of you that have ever caught a small muskie, like you know, around 20 inches or so, maybe even a little bit less, those fish tend to be really, really spotted. But you know that that as those fish get older, the adults end up looking very differently. Um, they tend to not have spotting, uh, in, especially in water bodies, we don't tend to see that spotting very, uh, very uh, often. So the question is, how do color patterns actually uh, establish themselves on the body of, of fish? And uh, much about this topic kind of remains a bit of a mystery. We, we kind of know some fundamentals, but specifically how they form and, and, and how they change through development um, there's definite, some definite gaps in our knowledge. So we do know that uh, color patterns involve certain cells called chromatophores. So a chromatophore is basically just a cell that contains some kind of pig pigment. So we have melanin in our skin, right? Uh, so a melanophore would be a, a chromatophore that contains melanin, but there's other kinds of pigment types. One thing that we do know is that pigment can actually uh, be moved around the body. And this uh, this can happen through like short-term or short uh, short distance communication, where a cell actually reaches out, touches another chromatophore, and then that chromatophore moves, and then the other one chases up to it. And basically, they just chase each other around the body. And that's what you're actually seeing in the top right, uh, this top right figure here, where one chromatophore touches another one, that other one ends up moving away, and that first one that actually did the touching chases up to it, touches it again, and they just kind of play this game of cat and mouse. Imagine this happening like all over the body as these little chromatophores move around. Um, one thing though that ends up happening is those, those cells will eventually die. So if these cells are, but the pigment doesn't go anywhere. So what happens is the cells die, they lose the ability to move around, and you end up getting like pooling of pigment in certain areas of the body. And that can actually help lock in pigmentation on the body. And eventually that can lead to the color patterns that we end up seeing in fish. Uh, we, of course, also know that, that, that color patterns and, and uh, pigment can change relative to the surrounding environment. So uh, you, you go bass fishing, you might catch a light colored bass if it's been uh, over uh, in, you know, light colored water. And then, you know, sometime later that bass, you might hold it in your live well, it ends up kind of getting a little darker, or maybe it gets a little lighter. Um, and, you know, things like cuttlefish and octopi can all change colors. Chameleons can change colors really quickly. Here's a little video of pigment actually changing very, very quickly. You can see the surrounding area gets a lot lighter in complexion compared to like the start of the video there. Uh, now, one question that, that, that sometimes is brought up in this topic is, is, do similarly patterned fish end up spawning together? In biology, we call this assortative mating, where individuals are mating with other individuals uh, that share some characteristics. So we know bass do this. They do this based on size. Big female will want to spawn with, a, tend to spawn with a, a larger uh, male. Do muskies do this relative to spawning with other individuals with similar color patterns? The, the answer to that is we're not really sure about this. 
And there's kind of conflicting evidence out there as to whether fish actually will assortatively mate based on color patterns. Some, some studies say it does occur mostly in uh, marine fishes and other studies with marine fishes and, and or guppies tend to uh, not really show, it, show, that, uh, show that there's evidence of that. Now, let's say that this might be happening in, uh, in, in a musky population. Could spawning in the same locations actually end up creating families of similarly patterned fish? Now, this is kind of intriguing because we do know that muskies spawn in the same locations year after year. They're very faithful to particular areas within a water body that they'll go and spawn in. Now, the, to answer that question, though, gets a lot trickier. Uh, this would require very large-scale genetic testing to trace family histories. You'd have to link individuals within a family tree and their color patterns and see how that gets passed on. Uh, it gets very difficult. Is it possible that this happens? Yes, it's definitely possible. Is it likely? Again, big question mark there. Not really sure. Um, the sort of begs the question, then, if muskies have different color patterns and we see some of these color patterns expressed more frequently than others, does that mean there's maybe some behavioral difference within the population? So for example, that spotted fish on the top there tends to be an atypical color pattern for the Ottawa River, whereas Mike's fish on the bottom, that kind of color pattern tends to be a little more predominant in, uh, in the Ottawa River. Is the reason we don't see these spotted muskies on the auto because they spend a lot of time roaming around in open water. And this type of color pattern, that kind of fish tends to be present in the shallow water areas where, where, where more anglers are targeting. Uh, again, we're not sure. This has, never been, this has never been studied in muskies, but certainly there are other species that, that, have, that have different appearances within a species or even within a population and will actually segregate within a water body in, into different areas. So like lake trout's a good example of this in the Great Lakes. Um, yeah, so we really don't know the answer to this question. It's possible we could, we could answer this through telemetry by tracking fish. So there's a little radio transmitter on a fish from Project Noble Beast. We could apply telemetry. We might be able to use another technique, but uh, it's, it's certainly very intriguing. I, I'd, be, I'd be curious to know myself. Um, yeah, so, you know, I, this is going to be the start to a whole series uh, on, on the Muskie Mondays uh, uh, broadcast. And so I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, potentially, an, you know, answering a bunch of your questions uh, over the course of, of the Muskie Mondays broadcast. So what I'd say is if you have questions, uh, you, folks in the audience have questions, if you want to send them in to John, you could email them directly to me even if you want to ask some other science-related question. My email's there. And uh, I'll, I'll take a look at the questions and, and come back next week and, and, uh, and pick something else apart. Or as I say to my students, I'll ramble on about something. <laughs> Sean, I encourage you to come and ramble and as much as you want and as long as you want. That was absolutely fantastic. And you know, I'm just going to add something from a, a guide perspective about tying um, your knowledge and research to the real world. That atypical fish that, that Sean showed you, that really interesting Ottawa River spotty um, there, that's Jay Cressman. I fished every year with Jay for a lot of years. Um, he and Dale, fantastic, fantastic fishermen. That's an area I fish uh, a lot and all season long. I don't see that color pattern. And then there's a specific temperature where those fish seem to come in. And we got 11 fish in that pattern out of that area over the next three or four days after they showed up. And so, you know, for me, um, I want to know what that puzzle is. You know, those, fi those, fish, those fish came together in my mind. Um, they're all in really good shape. Doesn't look like they've been caught or been in a net. So, you know, why, why, why? And that's what the research for is for. Love what you do. Send your questions in. Can't wait to have you on next week, Sean. Thanks a lot. Right on. Oh, it looks like we maybe have one question. Maybe oh. we could take we could take one question here and then does that work for you, John? Because I know you got other guests on the show. What do you want to do there? You know what? You like I said, you ramble as long as you want on. All right. How about, me, I, how about I? How about I answer Adam's uh, question here, and then if anyone's got more questions, 
we'll 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 be sure to you know Lisa and the team and John and I will uh, will take a look at the questions. So let's see. Adam says, "Hey Sean, do, you, do these colors have any relationship to efficient lives deep versus shallow, clear water versus dirty water, stationary versus transient lifestyle?" So so I grew up bass fishing before I got in, into muskies. I grew up bass fishing and um, bass change color quite readily uh, depending on the on the surrounding background so I, I would fish a lot of dirty reservoirs in in illinois those fish tended to be really light in color but then during like the spawning season even if the water was kind of dirty they would they would get pretty dark um and then you go to a clear body of water and 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 you pull a fish out of a out of clear body of water and it's pretty dark you put it in a live well and it gets really light in color with muskies, it, I think it's a little bit different. I don't think that they really change color as easily or as readily as, say, something like a bass does. Um, but I think that there's there's probably some truth to like depth of water and 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 relative clarity within certain areas of a water body that would have an influence on their body. And and this is really Adam. This is really like this is really what we're talking about whether these color patterns have uh, are reflective of different behavioral patterns we just really don't know that it's not it's not been studied in muskie it's been studied to some degree in, in other species but it's never been studied in muskies so it would be interesting to, to look into this for sure fantastic adam great question thanks and thank you again sean um can't wait to see you next week you guys can catch sean every month at the ottawa chapter Muskie's Canada meetings as well. Come on out. All right. Thanks, John. Pleasure.